brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. World War One. World War I, also known as the First World War, the Great War, the Chemist's War, or the War to End All Wars, was a global war originating in Europe that lasted from 28 July 1914 to the 11th of November 1918. More than 70 million military personnel, including 60 million Europeans, were mobilized in one of the largest wars in history. Over 9 million combatants and 7 million civilians died as a result of the war, a casualty rate exacerbated by the belligerents' technological and industrial sophistication and the tactical stalemate caused by grueling trench warfare. It was one of the deadliest conflicts in history and paved the way for major political changes, including revolutions in many of the nations involved and to the Second World War 21 years later. The war drew in all the world's economic great powers, assembled in two opposing alliances, the Allies versus the Central Powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Although Italy was a member of the Triple Alliance alongside Germany and Austria-Hungary, it did not join the Central Powers as Austria-Hungary had taken the offensive against the terms of the alliance. These alliances were reorganized and expanded as more nations entered the war. Italy, Japan, and the United States joined the Allies, while the Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria joined the Central Powers. The trigger for the war was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary by Yugoslav nationalist Gavrilo Princip in Sarajevo on 28 June 1914. This set off a diplomatic crisis when Austria-Hungary delivered an ultimatum to the Kingdom of Serbia and entangled international alliances formed over the previous decades were invoked. Within weeks, the major powers were at war, and the conflict soon spread around the world. On 25 July Russia began mobilization, and on 28 July the Austro-Hungarians declared war on Serbia. Germany presented an ultimatum to Russia to demobilize, and when this was refused, declared war on Russia on 1 August. Being outnumbered on the Eastern Front, Russia urged its Triple Entente ally France to open up a second front in the West. Back in 1870, the Franco-Prussian War had ended the Second French Empire and ceded the provinces of Alsace-Lorraine to a unified Germany. Bitterness over that defeat and the determination to retake Alsace-Lorraine made the acceptance of Russia's plea for help an easy choice. So France began full mobilization on 1 August and, on 3 August, Germany declared war on France. The border between France and Germany was heavily fortified on both sides so according to the Schlieffen plan. Germany then invaded neutral Belgium and Luxembourg before moving towards France from the north, leading the United Kingdom to declare war on Germany on 4 August due to their violation of Belgian neutrality. After the German march on Paris was halted in the Battle of the Marne, what became known as the Western Front settled into a battle of attrition, with a trench line that changed little until 1917. On the Eastern Front, the Russian army led a successful campaign against the Austro-Hungarians, but the Germans stopped its invasion of East Prussia in the battles of Tannenberg and the Mashurian Lakes. In November 1914, the Ottoman Empire joined the Central Powers, opening fronts in the Caucasus, Mesopotamia and the Sinai. In 1915, Italy joined the Allies, and Bulgaria joined the Central Powers. Romania joined the Allies in 1916, as did the United States in 1917. The Russian government collapsed in March 1917 and a revolution in November followed by a further military defeat brought the Russians to terms 
with the Central Powers via the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which granted the Germans a significant victory. After a stunning German offensive along the Western Front in the spring of 1918, the Allies rallied and drove back the Germans in a series of successful offensives. On 4 November 1918, the Austro-Hungarian Empire agreed to an armistice, and Germany, which had its own trouble with revolutionaries, agreed to an armistice on the 11th of November 1918, ending the war in victory for the Allies. By the end of the war, or soon after, the German Empire, Russian Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire ceased to exist. National borders were redrawn with several independent nations restored or created, and Germany's colonies were parceled out among the victors. During the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, the Big Four imposed their terms in a series of treaties. The League of Nations was formed, with the aim of preventing any repetition of such a conflict. This effort failed, and economic depression, renewed nationalism, weakened successor states, and feelings of humiliation eventually contributed to the start of World War II. Names From the time of its start until the approach of World War II, the First World War was called simply the World War or the Great War, and thereafter the First World War or World War I at the time. It was also sometimes called the War to End War or the War to End All Wars due to its then unparalleled scale and devastation. In Canada, Maclean's magazine in October 1914 wrote, Some wars named themselves. This is the Great War. During the interwar period, the war was most often called the World War and the Great War in English-speaking countries. The term, First World War, was first used in September 1914 by the German biologist and philosopher Ernst Haeckel, who claimed that, there is no doubt that the course and character of the feared, European War, will become the First World War in the full sense of the word, citing a wire service report in the Indianapolis Star on 20 September 1914 after the onset of the Second World War in 1939. The terms World War I or the First World War became standard, with British and Canadian historians favoring the First World War, and Americans World War I. Political and Military Alliances During the 19th century, the major European powers went to great lengths to maintain a balance of power throughout Europe, resulting in the existence of a complex network of political and military alliances throughout the continent by 1900. These began in 1815, with the Holy Alliance between Prussia, Russia and Austria. When Germany was united in 1871, Prussia became part of the new German nation. Soon after, in October 1873, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck negotiated the League of the Three Emperors between the monarchs of Austria-Hungary, Russia and Germany. This agreement failed, because Austria-Hungary and Russia could not agree over Balkan policy, leaving Germany and Austria-Hungary in an alliance formed in 1879, called the Dual Alliance. This was seen as a method of countering Russian influence in the Balkans as the Ottoman Empire continued to weaken. This alliance expanded in 1882 to include Italy in what became the Triple Alliance. Bismarck had especially worked to hold Russia at Germany's side in an effort to avoid a two-front war with France and Russia. When Wilhelm II ascended to the throne as German Emperor, Bismarck was compelled to retire, and his system of alliances was gradually de-emphasized. For example, the Kaiser refused, in 1890, to renew the reinsurance treaty with Russia. Two years later, 
the Franco-Russian alliance was signed to counteract the force of the Triple Alliance. In 1904, Britain signed a series of agreements with France, the Entente Cordiale, and in 1907, Britain and Russia signed the Anglo-Russian Convention. While these agreements did not formally ally Britain with France or Russia, they made British entry into any future conflict involving France or Russia a possibility, and the system of interlocking bilateral agreements became known as the Triple Entente. Arms Race German industrial and economic power had grown greatly after unification and the foundation of the empire in 1871 following the Franco-Prussian War. From the mid-1890s on, the government of Wilhelm II used this space to devote significant economic resources for building up the Kaiserliche Marine, established by Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, in rivalry with the British Royal Navy for world naval supremacy. As a result, each nation strove to outbuild the other in capital ships. With the launch of in 1906, the British Empire expanded on its significant advantage over its German rival. The arms race between Britain and Germany eventually extended to the rest of Europe, with all the major powers devoting their industrial base to producing the equipment and weapons necessary for a pan-European conflict. Between 1908 and 1913, the military spending of the European powers increased by 50%. Conflicts in the Balkans Austria-Hungary precipitated the Bosnian crisis of 1908-1909 by officially annexing the former Ottoman territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina which it had occupied since 1878. This angered the Kingdom of Serbia and its patron, the Pan-Slavic and Orthodox Russian Empire. Russian political maneuvering in the region destabilized peace accords that were already fracturing in the Balkans, which came to be known as the powder keg of Europe. In 1912 and 1913, the First Balkan War was fought between the Balkan League and the fracturing Ottoman Empire. The resulting Treaty of London further shrank the Ottoman Empire, creating an independent Albanian state while enlarging the territorial holdings of Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, and Greece. When Bulgaria attacked Serbia and Greece on 16 June 1913, it lost most of Macedonia to Serbia and Greece, and southern Dobroja to Romania in the 33-day Second Balkan War, further destabilizing the region. The great powers were able to keep these Balkan conflicts contained, but the next one would spread throughout Europe and beyond. Sarajevo Assassination Although some believe it depicts Ferdinand Baer, a bystander, on 28 June 1914, Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand visited the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo. A group of six assassins, from the Yugoslavist group Marda Bosna, supplied by the Serbian Black Hand, had gathered on the street where the Archduke's motorcade would pass, with the intention of assassinating him. Kabrinovich threw a grenade at the car, but missed. Some nearby were injured by the blast, but Ferdinand's convoy carried on. The other assassins failed to act as the cars drove past them. About an hour later, when Ferdinand was returning from a visit at the Sarajevo hospital, with those wounded in the assassination attempt, the convoy took a wrong turn into a street where, by coincidence, Princip stood. With a pistol, Princip shot and killed Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. The reaction among the people in Austria was mild, almost indifferent. As historian Zabin Ekzeman later wrote, the event almost failed to make any impression whatsoever. On Sunday and Monday, the crowds in Vienna listened to music and drank wine, as if nothing had happened. 
Nevertheless, the political impact of the murder of the heir to the throne was significant and has been described as a 9-11 effect, a terrorist event charged with historic meaning, transforming the political chemistry in Vienna. And although they were not personally close, the Emperor Franz Joseph was profoundly shocked and upset. The Austro-Hungarian authorities encouraged the subsequent anti-Serb riots in Sarajevo, in which Bosnian Croats and Bosniaks killed two Bosnian Serbs and damaged numerous Serb-owned buildings. Violent actions against ethnic Serbs were also organized outside Sarajevo. In other cities in Austro-Hungarian controlled Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia and Slovenia. Austro-Hungarian authorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina imprisoned and extradited approximately 5,500 prominent Serbs, 700 to 2,200 of whom died in prison. A further 460 Serbs were sentenced to death. A predominantly Bosniak special militia known as the Schutzkorps was established and carried out the persecution of Serbs. July Crisis the 29th of June 1914 and 1908. The assassination led to a month of diplomatic maneuvering between Austria-Hungary, Germany, Russia, France, and Britain, called the July Crisis. Believing correctly that Serbian officials were involved in the plot to murder the Archduke, and wanting to finally end Serbian interference in Bosnia, Austria-Hungary delivered to Serbia on 23 July the July Ultimatum, a series of ten demands that were made intentionally unacceptable, in an effort to provoke a war with Serbia. The next day, after the Council of Ministers of Russia was held under the chairmanship of the Tsar, at Krasno Selo, Russia ordered general mobilization for Odessa, Kiev, Kazan and Moscow military districts, and fleets of the Baltic and the Black Sea. They also asked other regions to accelerate preparations for general mobilization. Serbia decreed general mobilization on the 25th. The Serbs drafted their reply to the ultimatum in such a way as to give the impression of making significant concessions but as Christopher Clark states, Doc, this was a highly perfumed rejection on most points. This included Article 6, which demanded that Austrian delegates be allowed in Serbia for the purpose of participation in the investigation into the assassination. Following this, Austria broke off diplomatic relations with Serbia and, the next day ordered a partial mobilization. Finally, on 28 July 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. On 25 July, Russia, in support of its Serb protege, unilaterally declared, outside of the conciliation procedure provided by the Franco-Russian military agreements, partial mobilization against Austria-Hungary. On 30, Russia ordered general mobilization against Germany. German Chancellor Bethmund Holweg waited until 31 for an appropriate response when Germany declared a state of danger of war. Kaiser Wilhelm II asked his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II, to suspend the Russian general mobilization. When he refused, Germany issued an ultimatum demanding its mobilization be stopped, and a commitment not to support Serbia. Another was sent to France, asking her not to support Russia if it were to come to the defense of Serbia. On 1 August, after the Russian response, Germany mobilized and declared war on Russia. This also led to the general mobilization in Austria-Hungary on 4 August. The German government issued demands to France that it remain neutral as they had to decide which deployment plan to implement. It being difficult if not impossible to change the deployment whilst it was underway. The modified German Schlieffen Plan, Aufmarsch 2 West, would deploy 80% of the army in the west 
and ALF Marsh IOST and ALF Marsh 2 OSD would deploy 60% in the west and 40% in the east as this was the maximum that the East Prussian railway infrastructure could carry. The French did not respond, but sent a mixed message by ordering their troops to withdraw from the border to avoid any incidents, and at the same time ordered the mobilization of her reserves. Germany responded by mobilizing its own reserves and implementing ALF Marsh II West. On 1 August Wilhelm ordered General Moltke to march the whole of the army to the east after he had been wrongly informed that the British would remain neutral as long as France was not attacked. The general convinced the Kaiser that improvising the redeployment of a million men was unthinkable, and that making it possible for the French to attack the Germans in the rear might prove disastrous. Yet Wilhelm insisted that the German army should not march into Luxembourg until he received a telegram sent by his cousin George V, who made it clear that there had been a misunderstanding. Eventually the Kaiser told Mogte, Now you can do what you want. Germany attacked Luxembourg on 2 August, and on 3 August declared war on France. On 4 August, after Belgium refused to permit German troops to cross its borders into France, Germany declared war on Belgium as well. Britain declared war on Germany at 1900 UTC on 4 August 1914, following an unsatisfactory reply to the British ultimatum that Belgium must be kept neutral confusion among the Central Powers. The strategy of the Central Powers suffered from miscommunication. Germany had promised to support Austria-Hungary's invasion of Serbia, but interpretations of what this meant differed. Previously tested deployment plans had been replaced early in 1914, but those had never been tested in exercises. Austro-Hungarian leaders believed Germany would cover its northern flank against Russia. Germany, however, envisioned Austria-Hungary directing most of its troops against Russia, while Germany dealt with France. This confusion forced the Austro-Hungarian army to divide its forces between the Russian and Serbian fronts. Serbian Campaign Oluj, 1915 Austria invaded and fought the Serbian army at the Battle of CER and Battle of Kolobara beginning on 12 August. Over the next two weeks, Austrian attacks were thrown back with heavy losses, which marked the first major Allied victories of the war, and dashed Austro-Hungarian hopes of a swift victory. As a result, Austria had to keep sizable forces on the Serbian front, weakening its efforts against Russia. Serbia's defeat of the Austro-Hungarian invasion of 1914 counts among the major upset victories of the 20th century. German forces in Belgium and France On the way to the front in 1914, Early in the war, all sides expected the conflict to be a short one. At the outbreak of World War I, 80% of the German army was deployed as seven field armies in the west according to the Plan Aufmarsch to West. However, they were then assigned to execute the retired deployment Plan Aufmarsch I West, also known as the Schlieffen Plan. This would march German armies through northern Belgium and into France, in an attempt to encircle the French army and then breach the second defensive area of the fortresses of Verdun and Paris and the Marne River. Auf Marsch I West was one of four deployment plans available to the German general staff in 1914. Each plan favoured certain operations but did not specify exactly how those operations were to be carried out, leaving the commanding officers to carry those out at their own initiative and 
with minimal oversight. Auf Marsch I West, designed for a one-front war with France, had been retired once it became clear it was irrelevant to the wars Germany could expect to face. Both Russia and Britain were expected to help France, and there was no possibility of Italian nor Austro-Hungarian troops being available for operations against France. But despite its unsuitability, and the availability of more sensible and decisive options, it retained a certain allure due to its offensive nature and the pessimism of pre-war thinking, which expected offensive operations to be short-lived, costly in casualties, and unlikely to be decisive. Accordingly, the Aufmarsch II West deployment was changed for the offensive of 1914. Despite its unrealistic goals and the insufficient forces Germany had available for decisive success, Moltke took Schlieffen's plan and modified the deployment of forces on the Western Front by reducing the right wing, the 1, to advance through Belgium, from 85% to 70%. In the end, the Schlieffen plan was so radically modified by Moltke that it could be more properly called the Moltke plan. The plan called for the right flank of the German advance to bypass the French armies concentrated on the Franco-German border, defeat the French forces closer to Luxembourg in Belgium and move south to Paris. Initially the Germans were successful, particularly in the Battle of the Frontiers. By 12 September, the French, with assistance from the British Expeditionary Force, halted the German advance east of Paris at the First Battle of the Marne, and pushed the German forces back some. The French offensive into southern Alsace, launched on 20 August with the Battle of Mulhaus, had limited success. In the east, Russia invaded with two armies. In response, Germany rapidly moved the 8th Field Army from its previous role as reserve for the invasion of France to East Prussia by rail across the German Empire. This army, led by General Paul von Hindenburg, defeated Russia in a series of battles collectively known as the First Battle of Tannenberg, while the Russian invasion failed. It caused the diversion of German troops to the east, allowing the Allied victory at the First Battle of the Marne. This meant Germany failed to achieve its objective of avoiding a long, two-front war. However, the German army had fought its way into a good defensive position inside France and effectively halved France's supply of coal. It had also killed or permanently crippled 230,000 more French and British troops than it itself had lost. Despite this, communications problems and questionable command decisions cost Germany the chance of a more decisive outcome. Asia and the Pacific in Melbourne, Australia, 1914 New Zealand occupied German Samoa on 30 August 1914. On the 11th of September, the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force landed on the island of Neupommern, which formed part of German New Guinea. On 28 October, the German cruiser sank the Russian cruiser Zemchug in the Battle of Penang. Japan seized Germany's Micronesian colonies and, after the siege of Tsingtao, the German coaling port of Qingdao on the Chinese Shandong Peninsula, as Vienna refused to withdraw the Austro-Hungarian cruiser from Tsingtao, Japan declared war not only on Germany, but also on Austria-Hungary. The ship participated in the defense of Tsingtao where it was sunk in November 1914. Within a few months, the Allied forces had seized all the German territories in the Pacific. Only isolated commerce raiders and a few holdouts in New Guinea remained. African Campaigns Near Tiberias, Ottoman Empire, 1914 Some of the first clashes of the war involved British 
French, and German colonial forces in Africa. On 6–7 August, French and British troops invaded the German protectorate of Togoland and Cameroon. On 10 August, German forces in southwest Africa attacked South Africa. Sporadic and fierce fighting continued for the rest of the war. The German colonial forces in German East Africa, led by Colonel Paul von Lettau Vorbeck, fought a guerrilla warfare campaign during World War I and only surrendered two weeks after the armistice took effect in Europe. Indian support for the Allies Germany attempted to use Indian nationalism and pan-Islamism to its advantage. She tried instigating uprisings in India, and sent a mission to Afghanistan urging her to join the war on the side of central powers. However, contrary to British fears of a revolt in India, the outbreak of the war saw an unprecedented outpouring of loyalty and goodwill towards Britain. Indian political leaders from the Indian National Congress and other groups were eager to support the British war effort, since they believed that strong support for the war effort would further the cause of Indian home rule. The Indian Army in fact outnumbered the British Army at the beginning of the war. About 1.3 million Indian soldiers and labourers served in Europe, Africa and the Middle East, while the central government and the princely states sent large supplies of food, money, and ammunition. In all, 140,000 men served on the Western Front and nearly 700,000 in the Middle East. Casualties of Indian soldiers totaled 47,746 killed and 65,126 wounded during World War I. The suffering engendered by the war, as well as the failure of the British government to grant self-government to India after the end of hostilities, bred disillusionment and fueled the campaign for full independence that would be led by Mohandas K. Gandhi and others. Trench warfare begins In a communications trench first day on the Somme, 1916 military tactics developed before World War I failed to keep pace with advances in technology and had become obsolete. These advances had allowed the creation of strong defensive systems, which out-of-date military tactics could not break through for most of the war. Barbed wire was a significant hindrance to massed infantry advances, while artillery, vastly more lethal than in the 1870s, coupled with machine guns, made crossing open ground extremely difficult. Commanders on both sides failed to develop tactics for breaching entrenched positions without heavy casualties. In time, however, technology began to produce new offensive weapons, such as gas warfare and the tank. Just after the First Battle of the Marne, Entente, and German forces repeatedly attempted maneuvering to the north in an effort to outflank each other, this series of maneuvers became known as the Race to the Sea. When these outflanking efforts failed, the opposing forces soon found themselves facing an uninterrupted line of entrenched positions. From Lorraine to Belgium's coast, Britain and France sought to take the offensive, while Germany defended the occupied territories. Consequently, German trenches were much better constructed than those of their enemy. Anglo-French trenches were only intended to be temporary, before their forces broke through the German defences. Both sides tried to break the stalemate using scientific and technological advances. On the 22nd of April 1915, at the Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans used chlorine gas for the first time on the Western Front. Several types of gas soon became widely used by both sides, and though it never proved a decisive battle-winning weapon, poison gas became one of the most feared and best-remembered horrors of the war. 
tanks were developed by Britain and France, and were first used in combat by the British. During the Battle of Flores Corslet on 15 September 1916, with only partial success. However, their effectiveness would grow as the war progressed. The Allies built tanks in large numbers. Whilst the Germans employed only a few of their own design, supplemented by captured Allied tanks. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.